This is the IELTS listening test. You will hear a number of different recordings and you will have to answer questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions and you will have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four parts. At the end of the test, you will be given 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet. Now turn to part one. You will hear a man who runs a transport hire company talking to a woman who wants to hire a vehicle. First, you have some time to look at questions one to five. Now listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 5. Good morning, Island Transport Company. This is Brian speaking. Morning, this is Jenny Cartwright here. I'm visiting the island next week and I want to hire some form of transport. No problem, Jenny. Island Transport can offer a range of different vehicles to hire. So, um, the first option is a motor scooter. They're very popular. Oh, right. And how much do they cost to hire? Well, you can hire them by the hour or by the day. Per hour, it's $15.50. And what about for a day? Daily, it's $49.99. That includes a full tank of petrol, but you need to fill it up before you bring it back. Is a scooter a good way to get around the island? Oh, yes. It's a lot of fun. Visitors really enjoy it. Do you provide helmets? Yes, of course, all sizes. We can also let you have gloves as well. It's not a bad idea. Oh, yes, I hadn't thought of that. The only thing is with the scooters, you have to keep to sealed roads. That means you can't ride on Battenberg Road, so you can't visit the far end of the island. Sorry, I didn't catch the name of the road. Could you spell it? Sure. It's spelled B-A-T-T-E-N-B-U-R-G. But there are still plenty of other places you can explore on a scooter. OK, and what about a car? Yes, we've got a range of cars. Well, there's four of us. But if we do go for the car option, we'd be happy with a very small basic one. An economy car would be $87.80 per day. That's for a four-door car. It can take five passengers. Right, OK. And a car is the best way to see the whole island. You can drive on all the roads. And if you'd like to go for a swim, you can drive right down to Green Bay, which visitors love. Well, a car is definitely something to consider. It's certainly a good price if we split it between the four of us. Exactly. Only thing is, it's pretty hot at this time of year. Does the car have air conditioning? Not that model, no. You need one of our bigger cars if you want that. Well, maybe it doesn't matter. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. The other option to consider is an e-bike. These are very popular, like a normal bicycle, but with electric power to help you along. How much are they? Normally they're $59 per day, but I can offer you a discounted rate at the moment of $52.20. Oh, OK. To be honest, a lot of our customers these days prefer e-bikes to motor scooters because they're so quiet and peaceful. On some e-bikes, the battery is really heavy, but on these bikes, it's nice and light. I've never ridden an e-bike before. How difficult is it? Not difficult at all. You'll find they are very easy to handle. Like I say, just a normal pedal bike, really, but you don't have to do too much work, which is a good thing because the island is quite hilly. These are good quality bikes, too. Well made with high-quality brakes, both front and back, so you won't have any problems. Well, that does sound like a lot of fun. Do they come with GPS? No, but we can provide you with a map. What about a lock? Yep. One of those as well, with each bike, so you can leave it securely if you want to. I think my friends will like the idea of an e-bike. A good compromise. Well, like I say, they're very popular these days. 
And another big advantage is that you don't have to have a licence for this type of vehicle. Well, let me discuss it with my friends and I'll get back to you. No problem. Thanks for your time. That is the end of part one. You now have one minute to check your answers to part one. Listening Part 2 You will hear a man talking to a group of people who are looking around a community garden. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to to 15. Well, good morning everyone and welcome to this open day at the community garden. Our garden belongs to the local community and, as you'll see, what we grow here is mostly fruit and different kinds of vegetables. First, I'll tell you some background information. Well, recently we made an interesting discovery at the garden. Before, we didn't know much about the history of this site. We only had a few documents and records. Then we found some ancient implements, like spades and forks, for digging. They were buried in the earth. Experts say these are at least 1,000 years old. So people have been using this land for growing produce for a long time. There are some photographs of these implements in the clubhouse, as well as a diagram of what we think the garden might have looked like, if you want to look later. So, why was this location so good for gardening? As you can see, we're in a slight valley, and storms blow very hard up this valley, which can be a problem. But being in a valley, we get good freezing frosts here in winter, which gardeners like because it kills the bugs. The great thing, though, is the stream that runs through the valley, so we can irrigate the gardens even through long, dry summers. Now, what we do know is that in 1860, gardening stopped here. This was a time of rapid development in this area, and on that date, the city infirmary was constructed on this site, so this is where doctors and surgeons worked to take care of the health needs of the growing population. Also, many new houses were put up for people who commuted into the city each day to work. There was even talk of a new military camp, although that never happened in the end. Then in the 1980s, the old buildings here were removed, and this land again became a productive garden. Today, these gardens produce large quantities of fruit and vegetables. Each plot of land is worked by a volunteer member of the garden, and they donate what they grow to families in this neighbourhood who are struggling financially. Occasionally, we're approached by local businesses and restaurants wanting to buy our organic produce, but we just don't have enough. We also have a good relationship with the local college. In fact, several of the academics there are members of the garden. Each week, undergraduates enrolled on the college's horticulture course have a class here to learn about their subject firsthand. And in future, the college hopes to hold workshops here to help local people establish vegetable gardens at home. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. OK, now I'll just point out a few places of interest around the gardens. So can you all look at your maps, please? OK, so we're now standing at the main entrance to the gardens, outside the clubhouse. So you might be interested in our worm farms. This is where we make fertiliser. To get there, from the main entrance, head north. You'll pass gardens on either side of the path. Just before the path curves round to the right, there's a turning on the left. Go down there and the worm farms are inside the first building you come to. It's also worth visiting our seed store. Again, 
Head north and follow the path as it curves round to the right, through the gardens. You'll come to the orchard. Follow the path around the edge of the orchard, but don't go too far. The seed store is actually located inside the orchard, a very pretty spot. Now, the machinery shed might interest some of you. From the main entrance, just go into the car park and walk right to the end. You'll see a little path heading out to the west. It's down there. Our compost heaps are also pretty impressive. So head north from the main entrance, go past the first gardens and take the first turning on the left. Go to the end of that path. The compost heaps are built in the shape of a letter U. The drying room is also interesting. This is where we dry fruit to preserve it. To see how it's done, walk up through the gardens till you come to the orchard. Keep heading north and the drying room is right at the very end of that path, as far as you can go. Now, one other thing I'll mention are the outside toilet facilities. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers to part two. Part 3 You will hear two students talking about their university studies. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Oh, hi George. How's it going? Hi Martina. It's going well. How about you? How's university life? Well, it's great. Apart from the studying, of course. <laughs> yeah, me too. What are you studying? I seem to remember that you were going to do art. That was your best subject, wasn't it? No, not really. I just liked the teacher. He was French and had an amazing accent. My favourite subject was history but I couldn't see what career that would give me. Ah, oh, right. So what did you choose? Well, I found it really difficult to decide. I was really good at science, but I must admit, I never really enjoyed studying it. So, in the end, I decided to opt for English, which was my second favourite subject, and I thought it would be more useful to me than studying anything else. So, that's what I'm doing. Um, how are you finding university? Well, it's a bit of a challenge, I suppose. Are you finding it difficult? Mm, well, some of it. I'm doing mechanical engineering, which is really interesting, but it covers quite a lot of areas, like materials science, machine design, physics, and of course mechanics, and they're all fine. But it's maths that I'm struggling with. It's a lot harder than it was at school. I can believe it. It all sounds very difficult to me. But then I never was very good at mechanical things. I suppose it must involve some practical work. Well, not at the moment. Currently, it's nearly all theory, so it's a bit heavy going. I guess you need to start with that so that you can get a grasp of the concepts and learn a few facts before you start putting it into practice. It must be a lot different to the course that I'm taking. Yes, but in a few weeks we'll be having a lot more practical experience. In fact, I've got a great assignment this term, working on jet engines, which means I'll be going on a few field trips to a nearby airport. Oh, that's great. It sounds like you're going to be very busy. Yes, I'm not sure how I'm going to cope with the work. We have a lot of lectures, and that's fine. The lecturers are very knowledgeable, and I learn a lot from them. But we also have a lot of seminars, and I find, with so many people expressing their views, it can get quite frustrating. 
It would be better if we didn't have so many of those. Yes, it's the same for me. Before you hear the rest of the discussion, you have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 27 to 30. Um, how are the students at your place? Well, I haven't really met anyone yet. They all seem a bit quiet. Perhaps they're working hard. Mm. They don't appear to be very studious here, but they are very friendly. I must say, I've been doing a lot of sitting around and chatting over the last week or so. <laughs> well, that's good. The only person I've spoken to, really, is my tutor. He's very approachable and seems to understand how difficult it can be starting university. Hmm, it's good to have someone you can talk to, and he may help you meet other students. Actually, that doesn't bother me. I'm bound to get to know some people sooner or later. It's more a question of finding out what I need to do, where to go and so on. I hope he can help me with that. Oh, I would have thought so. Well, we certainly have a lot of work ahead of us. It seems like a long time, doesn't it? Studying for three years. <laughs> yes, it does. But I'm sure it'll go quickly. You know, I'm really dreading the first assessment. Yes. For the course I'm doing, we have to hand our first one in at the end of next month. Really? So, have you got the topic yet? No, but we'll get it soon. I'm not sure how much we have to write yet. Not too much, I hope. Mm, I know what you mean. And it's hard to study, especially where I am now. Oh? Where are you living? I'm living in a hall of residence. I thought that would be a good idea, as there'd be a lot of people around, but I'm finding it a bit noisy. I can see that I'm going to have problems when I really need to get down to some work. So, I guess you need to be somewhere on your own then? Yes. Well, I do like to have some people around me, so I'd prefer to live with a family somewhere, in a house not too far from the university. Well, good luck with that. Yes, thanks. And good luck to you as well. Oh, I have to dash now. I've another lecture in ten minutes. Bye for now. Bye. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers to part three. Part 4. You will hear an anthropology student giving a talk about traditional Polynesian navigation. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Hi everyone. Today I'm going to be talking about traditional Polynesian navigation and voyaging. Now, in case you don't know, the islands of Polynesia are in the Pacific Ocean and include Hawaii, Tahiti and Samoa. All of these islands were originally uninhabited by humans and for many years there was a debate about where the Polynesian people had migrated from. It was once suggested that they came from the Americas. However, that debate has been settled. Today, anthropologists recognise that the Polynesians began their journeys in Asia and from there migrated eastwards to the Pacific Islands. 
It's believed all the Polynesian islands had been settled by the 13th century. When European explorers arrived in the Pacific in the 17th and 18th centuries, they were impressed by the local canoes. European ships were much stronger, but the indigenous vessels were considerably faster when under sail. What we now know is that Polynesians sailed across open ocean, out of sight of land, long before this occurred elsewhere. And to make these voyages possible, they built remarkable ocean-going canoes. The canoes had two hulls, so are sometimes called catamarans. They were equipped with large paddles, but these were not a form of propulsion. Instead, the paddles were positioned at the back of the canoe to make steering the vessel possible. All these ocean-going canoes had sails. Polynesian sails were triangular in shape and made from the pandanus plant, which grows on nearly all Pacific islands. It was also necessary to make warm clothing, as even in tropical waters, people could get cold on long voyages. Materials like wool and cotton were unknown to Polynesians. However, the paper mulberry tree grows on most Pacific islands, and its bark was remarkably flexible and was used in the manufacture of clothing. Next, we come to the issue of navigation at sea. How did Polynesians find their way once they were out of sight of land? We know that they did not have the magnetic compass, which told other navigators which direction was north. But the Polynesian navigators understood when numerous stars rose and set on the horizon. And using this, they could identify 32 different directions. However, this information about the stars was extremely complex, and therefore remembering it all was a challenge. So the navigators had created long and complicated songs to help them recall all the information they needed. Using the stars to navigate was effective, so long as the sky was clear. But when it was cloudy, the navigators couldn't see the stars. How did they find direction then? Well, they still knew which way to sail the canoe by studying the waves, which usually came from predictable directions in the Pacific at different times of the year. Sometimes they were sailing between islands they had visited before, but very often they were trying to find new islands. How did they know that land was nearby, just over the horizon? Well, there were various techniques. The navigators were experts at recognising those particular birds whose habitat was the open ocean and those that lived close to islands. So this was one way they knew that land wasn't far away. They were also skilled at noticing changes to the sea itself. The temperature of the water is constant in that part of the Pacific, but its colour could vary in the proximity of land, and that was something else that they were able to detect. Well, as technology developed, traditional voyaging all but died out. The Polynesian peoples travelled by steamship and later aeroplane like everyone else. However, in recent history, there has been renewed interest in traditional voyaging. It began in 1976 when a new canoe, named Horculea, was built as a replica of traditional Polynesian vessels. This canoe was sailed from Hawaii to Tahiti, a distance of more than 4,000 kilometres across open ocean. And all the navigation was done using the techniques I've outlined today. The crew did not use modern instruments on the voyage. Since then, there has been a remarkable renaissance of traditional voyaging. Numerous canoes have been built in different Polynesian countries, which have sailed to almost every part of the Pacific. And the Hawkeulea has now completed a three-year circumnavigation of the world. As well as sailing, these voyages have sparked renewed interest among Polynesians in learning about their traditional cultures. 
the canoes themselves operate as floating classrooms, teaching young people about, for example, the music their ancestors once enjoyed. Another aspect of this has been the teaching of Polynesian languages, some of which were in danger of dying out. Now, one thing I'd like to add is... That is the end of part four. You now have one minute to check your answers to part four.